Hi, Joel MD here, also known as Dr. Bones of the survival medicine website doomandbloom.net and also the best-selling books, The Survival Medicine Handbook, Alton's Antibiotics and Infectious Disease, Alton's Pandemic Preparedness Guide, and others. Okay, the you-know-what has hit the fan and you're off the grid and the only one around with some medical knowledge and supplies is you. Someone has had a mishap and there's a skin laceration several inches long. You've decided to close the wound. An important decision has to be made with consideration of a number of factors that we've talked before on this channel about. After stopping the bleeding and cleaning the wound in the field, the major concern when closing a laceration is the risk of infection. The best way to avoid a major infection is getting the wound site ready before the procedure begins. You've got bacteria on your skin that's part of the ecosystem that is, well, you. It's supposed to be there, but it's not supposed to be under the skin where the same bacteria could cause a life-threatening infection. Cleaning the wound and prepping the skin removes as many bacteria as possible through shaving if needed, washing, disinfecting, and draping the area you're going to be working on. It won't be as effective as you'll see in a modern operating room, but it'll help. In the field, you should flush the wound vigorously with clean drinking water or normal saline solution through an irrigation syringe if you have it. Stronger chemicals like alcohol, undiluted betadine, and hydrogen peroxide dry out soft tissue. Now that said, I've seen some people use a very dilute betadine solution from time to time. Once in the survival procedure room, wash your hands. Very, very important. In particularly hairy areas like the scalp, the skin may have to be shaved. If this is necessary, it's best to have an electric clipper, but off the grid, well, it's at least have a supply of these cheap plastic razors. Now, just as an aside, here's my dad's razor that he used as a teenager in World War II, a safety razor made by some guy named Gillette. And this is my grandfather's razor that his dad gave him when he came of age a hundred years ago. Anyway, loose hair is wiped off after shaving and the skin is then washed with something like Hibiclens skin cleanser or when that runs out, soap and water. Once you've rinsed and wiped that dry, it's time to put on antiseptic prep. Skin prep solutions used on laceration injuries may be a povidone iodine solution like betadine, chlorhexidine like Hibiclens, or even rubbing alcohol if that's all that's left. There are a number of ways to prep the skin off the grid. You can use wipes or swab sticks like these for small lacerations, or you can use sterile gauze on an instrument for larger wounds. We'll use betadine today. Hi, Nurse Amy here. I just want to do the second part of this video and we're going to prep our patient today. I have went ahead and poured some of that betadine prep that Dr. Alton was talking about into this bowl. We've opened up our gauze. I have an instrument so we don't have to touch the patient directly. And we're going to put on some clean gloves. So just do that. Make sure that you wash your hands before you put gloves on. Super important. You want to wash between every step. If you don't have soap and water, make sure you use some hand sanitizer. We're going to go ahead and pick the gauze up with our instrument. And we're going to dip it in the betadine. And we're going to start on one edge right here and we're going to do three circles without going back and fixing any part in case you miss it, and ever widening areas. Now if this was a thigh or a large area, skin area, definitely want to do three. But if it's smaller, we probably could get away with two because this is a larger gauze. But we're going to do this three times. If you find there's an area that you didn't cover, on the first or second time, do not go back and fix it. That is a dirty gauze. So one time around, a little bit wider, and then just for show and tell, we're gonna do an even wider circle. There we go, discard, pick up a new one, little betadine, and then third time, one time around, two times around, three times around and then discard. Now we didn't necessarily want to get betadine in here but since I have such a tight space and we really have larger gauze than I normally would have used here so not so much prep in here. Uh, is this going to harm the patient? No but you don't really want to get all that betadine inside of there. 
So we'll go ahead and dry that up. Because remember, we've cleaned the wound before. We don't need to clean inside. We'll dry that up so we'll be able to see the tissues when we go to suture. Okay, so after you've prepped the patient, you remove your clean gloves, pinch the palm, put that glove inside of here, and you've made like a little trash can. And then just throw that off of your table. You're gonna throw this much further off. I'm just showing you discarding because I wanted to go ahead and get that betadine on. When you drape the patient, you're going to use sterile gloves from your sterile field. I showed you how to set that up already. So we're gonna open the sterile gloves. This would be on your sterile field, not by the patient. So just imagine, remember where we set those up. They open up like a book. Do not touch the inside of the package. Pick up one with the cuff. Put your hand in it. Adjust your fingers. Do not touch the inside of the glove. I have not touched the inside of the glove. Let go. Pick up the cuff with your right hand. Only touch the inside of the cuff. Adjust your fingers. And then pull it on. If you didn't miss some fingers, you can go ahead and adjust it now. What we want to do is pick up our sterile drapes. I can touch the inside of this package and discard that because these gloves are sterile. We would take our drapes, place one, do not touch anything but the drapes right now, the top of the drape, not the underside, once it's touched a patient. So if you needed to move these, you can move them like this or like this, but don't touch outside of it. We can also do this. We have a nice squared off area where we only see the laceration. The drape that comes with the suture kit, you can actually place that on top so you have a little bit more of a working space. And when I showed you how to set up the sterile area, you'll see that I had cut the drape a little bit bigger so it would fit this kind of laceration. So you would put that on. And that's it. Again, taking gloves, pinch the palm. Once you are done suturing, Pick this one up, never touching the inside. This is the garbage, and that's it. Okay, you're prepped. This is Nurse Amy. Thank you so much, and now I'll give you back to Dr. Alton. This is all meant to isolate the surgical area, creating what we call a sterile field, where you can't see any areas that weren't painted with the antiseptic. You can use three of these sterile towels to create a triangular opening or more commonly four to create a rectangular one. Some laceration trays will have a drape that has a window in it called a fenestrated drape that you might have to extend for larger cuts as demonstrated by Nurse Amy in our last video. Now you're ready to get to work. Next time we'll close this prepped and draped wound using a method or two that I consider most suitable for the off-grid medic in survival scenarios. This is Joe Alton, MD, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you the best of health and good times or bad. Thanks for watching. Learn more about wound closure and 150 other medical topics in survival settings with our latest edition of the Survival Medicine Handbook and other books available at Amazon or at store.doomandbloom.net and get wound closure and other kits and supplies at store.doomandbloom.net. Thanks again. Hey, if you don't have a good medical or dental kit, I know where you can find one. Just check out Nurse Amy's entire line at store.doomandbloom.net. You'll be glad you did.